kind of becoming spring and kind of you have less need to hide in the fluorescent microscopy room. But um, as you know, we have um, um, a short introduction to the speaker, then about half an hour, a little bit longer, maybe for 35 minutes. And then today mm -hmm. we have again the favorite and wonderful quiz. And then mm -hmm. any question on, you want to ask, um, put them into the chat because they will be moderated afterwards and we go through them. You mm -hmm. can ask them probably yourself, but otherwise we pick them up and ask the speaker for you if you're too shy. So yeah. welcome, <laughs> welcome Harold from Janelia Farm and please Kirti introduce from Janelia, sorry. <laughs> Uh, welcome everyone, and uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Harald. He's, he's one of my favorite scientists, uh, which you will know the way he will give the presentation. So Harald is a physicist by training, and uh, in his early career, he studied Bose-Einstein uh, uh, condensates, and uh, uh, it's, 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 it's probably called the fifth matter of physics, and now he's uh, switched again to some cryo work, and hopefully... Uh, find some new states of matter in biology, if not phase separated. So the classic story about Harald is uh, he literally uh, started the whole single molecule palm storm field, uh, basically building up a palm, palm set up in his, in his living room with Eric. Uh, and as, as you might hear on some YouTube talks, how, how they talked about science during their long hikes and things like those. And later he went on uh, uh, at the NIH and uh, collaborated with Jennifer. So a lot, like a simply amazing story uh, to motivate a lot of people, you know, how much can be uh, just done by simple, you know, curiosity and uh, from, from personal funds also. So yeah, Herald, I, I won't take your time, but uh, a lot of amazing work uh, starting from your early career, which PhD was 40 years ago and coming back to the cryo things again. So, so looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. It's it's uh, you know thanks for the very kind introduction. I'll, and it's a really a pleasure to be here to to present some some of our work. And I'll be talking about uh, 3D imaging of cells by a technique called FIFSIM. And I'll also show how it can be correlated to fluorescence microscopy. <clears throat> and I'll take a little bit of a maybe historical perspective. You know, starting maybe shortly after. You know that period of unemployment with Eric Betzik when I joined Janelia, and sort of facing one of the first challenges when I landed at Janelia, where the big problem was, uh, can you image the circuit of a fly brain? Uh, Janelia was founded on two big areas: imaging and this question of the circuitry of uh, neuro neurons. And so, if you look at it carefully, uh, you know it has a certain volume you know, maybe about a, a 40th of a cubic millimeter, you know, you know, or 25th of a cubic millimeter, 40 million uh, cubic microns. And to see enough detail to see the neurons, you really need to sample with about eight nanometer voxels. So that means a lot of samples. And if you say you can acquire each data at one megahertz, it really means years of operation. And one of the really defining things which shaped a lot of the research is, or actually sort of the development, is that it needs to be perfect. When you image all of this, you don't want any have any gaps or missing data. Otherwise, you can't trace the neurons from one side to the other. So this means perfect imaging over with years of operation. And at the time we looked over the different modalities, um, this is a traditional way to do it. You cut sections with a diamond knife on water and look through it with TEM. Uh, there was a new technique where you just look at it, you cut it onto a tape, and then you can look at electrons scattered back. Um, there's another way. Another approach what Winfried developed in Heidelberg was just to cut the surface of a block and image that, and then cut a new surface and gradually work your way through the sample that way. These are all diamond knife techniques, and, but we opted for something a little bit different. Uh, which is focused ion beam to, to cut the surface and then image. So very briefly, most of you might know that, you scan the surface with an electron beam, you blade it away with a, a, a beam of gallium atoms, um, maybe a blade away two to eight nanometers. 
you image it again, and then another ablation occurs. And you just repeat this, you know, every minute you get a new cycle. So normally with diamond knife cutting, it's a little bit choppy. The section thicknesses have to be thick, maybe 30 nanometers. Sometimes you can push a little bit smaller. And in uh, the Z dimension, you just see, uh, you know, this quantization of the cut. If you can cut with finer steps, you can receive, resolve better details. And this is actually key to really tracing the circuits with a little bit more reliability uh, with the bits in. So we opted for that approach. So we got one of these machines and uh, tried it. And after three days, we're able to image this tiny little volume. Uh, so basically had a, a huge problem. The FibSim not really reliable more than a few days. And so we had to think very deeply about it and figure out with all our physics knowledge, what's the solution? Well, the solution is we just have to make it reliable for a few years. So this is easier said than done. And in fact, Sean Zhu, he's sort of the, uh, you know, the hero of this. He got these machines uh, to be optimized and also achieve a very high degree of reliability, uh, which is no small task. I mean, the number of odd and, you know, very frustrating and sometimes very amusing things which stop the uh, or interrupt the things were, were just countless and way beyond imagination. So it really took time to get through this. So he tamed it, he, we minimized the interrupts. Even if something happens, we can restart the machine gracefully without losing data. Uh, let's say a pump blows up or something like that. We have a comprehensive maintenance plan. We have a special room with temperature controls. Uh, you know, and rapid warnings if something goes wrong on the machine. Uh, so this is a, a very extended effort. A lot of work went into this. And so here, for example, is just one, one little aspect uh, of our modification. The FIB beam, it comes across. Now this focused ion beam can also be very dangerous. If it's a little bit too low, it cuts into the sample and can destroy it. It's a knife. And so we monitor the amount of FIB current that goes over the top of the sample as we ablate it away, the amount that scatters uh, from the sample surface. And then we also see what's the current going into the sample itself. And we look at a combination of these to sort of determine how much should we deflect this, uh, this beam. So the other thing is uh, Sean had to optimize it. So what's the best electron beam energy for optimal resolution? Uh, if you shoot the beam down into the sample, let's say with 1.2 keV, it penetrates you know, with on the order of about 10 nanometers. You can model these things with some uh, uh, simulation, either packages or build it yourself. Now, to get better resolution in the vertical direction, you can drop the energy, let's say only 800 volts, and you have five nanometer, you know, sort of typical penetration depth for the backscatter signal. So why not go lower to get even better resolution? Well, the problem comes in as you lower the landing energy, the scattering uh, energy for osmium versus cos uh, carbon or the rest of the sample drops. So you lose contrast. So really, as you go down below 800 or 700, uh, you lose contrast. And you have a, about 100 carbon atoms for every osmium. So you signal to noise drops to about one in this range right here. And XY resolution also improves a little bit by going to lower energy. So we typically operate in this, this range. And the other question in trying to optimize it and get best throughput is, uh, you know, how optimal uh, is the signal to noise? You know, are we really using every electron to its best value? And I, uh, machines are well designed and you know, we figure out the operating conditions and we can get it I think within a factor of two, some open questions on that. So typically an electron can come down, hits the sample. Many can scatter with high energy and they might scan outside the range of detection. Some sort of come out with very low energy and can be sort of focused back up. These are called the secondary electrons and then they can be detected. So as a function of angle and backscattered energy, you know, there's a region that are detected. 
and not detected. And uh, yeah, and so typically, you know, we find a good working distance around three, maybe a touch more than that uh, is, is good for the sample. And to measure signal to noise, I think it's find it very helpful to always look at the, uh, uh, you know, the actual data, not just sort of grayscale, but try to quantify it. It's, it's really a good guide for optimizing and understanding the difference between is there a machine that's not optimal or is this a sample that's not, not optimal? And quantification, I think, is super, super important and helpful. So if we just take a, a data here, make a line cut through it, you can see it'll, it'll wiggle up and down and there's a fair amount of noise on it. Now, that has a signal component. We could say, oh, the, the valleys, the cytosol between the membranes, that's the low area. We can mark it with a, a, a gray value here, actually a green value. And then we can set an upper threshold here uh, associated with a, a typical ridge value of, of the membranes. So we, here we could say the signal is 720 electrons on the membranes minus 630 electrons in the cytosol. So that's a difference of about 90 electrons on a pixel. And the noise is the square root of the shot noise that we have on here, which you can sort of extract also. So this image would have a signal to noise of three and a half. So this is typically what we try to do to understand the quality of our, our samples. So anyway, having optimized it so that it can run longer and uh, have better sig optimal signal to noise, we were then able to image, this is about data from seven years ago, Sean was able to image this whole brain, uh, not whole optical lobe part of the fly brain. And uh, here, this is looking at the chiasm where a lot of neurons are crossing each other. You can see the mitochondria and nucleus just went by there. And when you get, get to the end, you can sort of identify these are the synapses, these, these little T-bar structures right here, the dark things is where the connection gets made. So then we had one more problem to face. The FIPSEM can't mill greater than about 50 microns. Uh, so if we image an area and then we send a gallium beam across it, the milling actually becomes unstable as you go downstream. Uh, I like to think of it as like wind blowing on the pond. So uh, with the front edge on one side of the pond, uh, there are no waves. If you go to the downwind side, you begin to see instabilities and waves, and these grow as you go further down. So the question here then, how, how do we solve this? Um, we just cut it into slices less than 50 microns. And so Ken Hayworth was the person who suggested and tried and demonstrated, and amazingly, uh, it actually worked. We cut a fly into about 30 sections, like a loaf of bread into slices. And it enables us to paralyze the whole operation. And at the time we had two fib sims. And with that, we acquired a data set that we call the hemibrain. Um, and these are about 13 slices, I, I believe, you know, going across here from the middle. And it encompasses uh, you know, the, the central part of the brain and the olfactory uh, areas too. And here's what it looks like. These are 20 micron slices. And you're just seeing different regions of the central complex, zooming in a little bit there. Now, this is where we pass the data off to other people. And there's a lot of work. Actually, there was already quite a bit of work in stitching those slices together. And that was the amazing thing, that when you cut a slice like that, there's very little loss on the interfaces so that a, a good fidelity stitch can indeed be made. Um, next one has to identify synapses. And there's a, a, a group, the Genelia fly -EM group, which uh, identifies the synapses. It gets sent to, uh, uh, to Google and they do segmentation, identify each one of the neurons. And they use this uh, 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 flood filler, you know, approach and systematically could do that for all of the neurons within the data set. And, uh, and then of course, the data goes onward to, to annotators. This data is not perfect. It has to be proofread despite, you know, very good 
segmentation from the Google side, you know, there, it's, it's a very high bar. Um, and with time, you know, data comes out. Here's the, the central complex. Quick movie of it. You know, you can obviously see in flies, the cell bodies are outside. All the wiring and synapses are in this compact neuropil region. And this is not done for just one, but maybe multiple different organelles. Here we just sort of zoom in on the synapse from showing the raw data where it came from. And here's another contact to another neuron over there. And, and then this has to be done for the whole, the whole brain. So it's a, it's a big effort. And this was all published a, a year or two ago, and it's all available for public viewing on this website, you know, newprint.genealy.org. But this really represents, um, you know, a big effort on part of other people uh, getting the data out in a form that's easily uh, browsable, uh, but it does, you know, really uh, benefit from the quality and the isotropic nature that you can get with the FibSim. So essentially, I like to think of the space uh, that we've sort of opened up a, a bit of a new space where we can image. If you think of size of sample, going from one micron cube on a side to maybe one millimeter on a side, and resolution on another axis, you could say optical microscopy sits way up here at the top. Uh, electron microscopy tends to be small sections, but never large volumes. And uh, so if this is isotropic block face, some of the techniques I was showing at the very beginning do exist up here, but they're a little bit uh, choppy in the Z dimension. We sort of have a, a bit of a new space opened up down here with this uh, long-term imaging that uh, Sean developed. So presently, we've been operating these machines mainly for large throughput. And we do this by opening up the aperture, getting as much current as we can. And for electron microscopes, they tend to have a fair amount of spherical aberration and then chromatic aberration, depending on the aperture. And by reducing the current, cutting the aperture down, you can actually get better resolution, like that down here. So there's potentially a new area to look at. And we can quantify what the resolution is in that region. You know, in XY, we can look at the edge transition, which is our favorite way of looking at it. Uh, I'm not quite, I don't think it's appropriate to use ring correlation here exactly. It, it has, if you're trying to characterize the instruments. And this is resolution in X, resolution in Z, given by the distance to go up a step edge, either with 37 to 63 or 20 to 80%, which are common metrics that I'm sort of using. Um, yeah, and these are the, you know, 20 to 80 percent. So there's another region to look at down here with that smaller, uh, smaller current. Volume's going to be less than the whole fly brain, but I think still very interesting and still a new space as far as what other instruments uh, that exist can, can really see. This quickly shows the difference in resolution between 8 nanometer, 4 nanoamps that we're doing the fly brain and uh, what we can do by going down to much lower current and taking our time on smaller samples. Uh, example of data, I should mention staining, any staining improvements that happen, they are a big factor. Uh, and, you know, as maybe if not more important than the microscope itself. So effort, Zhuan Lu has sort of been working almost a decade on perfecting the staining for the fly brain, and that's, we really appreciate that. Now, once data has been taken, you know, it can be segmented. This is a, an early example of manual segmentation where you can trace out the ER, uh, you know, the contacts, vesicles, and other things uh, in a collaboration with uh, Pietro and Yume Wu at, uh, at Yale. Here's another quick example. Here we just took a, a picture of a Chlamydomonas. Here you can see the flagella uh, structure on it. Let me just play that. Again, it's sort of fun to see this. This can be done with the 
uh, TEM tomography uh, very nicely too, but it's super easy to do it in uh, uh, with Vivsim. You just toss it into the uh, the microscope. Uh, you run it. You can get a few cells with this kind of resolution. You don't have to worry about the cup plane going exactly in the right place. The same Chlamydomonas right here. This is the nucleus. Uh, the data is very dense. It's hard to really see everything, what's going on. And just doing a simple operation like masking out the surface of that nucleus. Uh, you can see there are little dots up here on the outer surface. You know, essentially shows us the nucleus is dotted with these polyribosomes, you know, which come in all sorts of uh, strange necklace like shapes. If you zoom in on one area, you can even see the nuclear pore structure, you know, inside there. Uh, you can see this with a traditional section cut TEM, but you're dealing with a section and it's not, you're not really able to, you know, pose a question, for example, like what do all of the polyribosomes look like on a nucleus or on the ER or anything like that? The whole volume data that you can get with PIPSAM really enables that. So with that kind of uh, resolution, we thought, well, it might be fun just to image a few standard reference cells, you know, wild type kind of cells so that people can judge for themselves whether this kind of data can be useful to formulate other experiments or not. And we spent a month imaging just a, a HeLa cell at four nanometers. And you can segment out, you know, mitochondria and other things like that, Glebert's doing the, that segmentation. Here's a zoom in of one particular area. Here's the centrosome, Golgi here. You can even see a microtubule going across right here, uh, nuclear pores. And you can almost see, you know, what might be, you know, the individual nucleosomes as each one of these little dots. Although in some cases it's a bit ambiguous, they might be merged together. So this was going beyond what we could do ourselves and we handed this over to a, a new project team called COSEM, Cell Organelle Segmentation of EM. And they took this data and with a, a little over a cubic of micron, had someone manually annotate all of the pixels in that uh, into a few different uh, categories, whether it's ER, lysosomes, mitochondria, et cetera. Here you can see all the microtubules in there. And this can form now the training data for applying it to the whole cell. This is just one example of such training data. There are multiple training data in this cell and in other cells too. And this is on a, a bioarchive. Uh, you know, Aubrey Weigel was leading the effort, and Larissa was sort of responsible for a lot of this. This is now the next step. You can apply uh, neural networks on here, UNET on, on this, and try now to segment the rest of the cell, you know, into the different categories, mitochondria, ER, and, and the like. So rather than show a lot of movies on this, I'd just like to say, just go to this website and you can see the data for yourself. There are about uh, 13 different data sets in there, at least at the time I made this uh, view graph. And uh, you can download, browse it in NeuroGlancer and uh, you know, just play with it, either the raw data or segmented data or whatever you want. Here's a, another example of, uh, that we did with a, a collaborator at, uh, at Harvard. Gokin Hodesh-Maligi uh, and Gunas Parthal and Anna were sort of the main people working on it. This is liver. You saw the nucleus up above. If you zoom in more closely, you can see the mitochondria between all these sheets of ER. And they took that data, they segmented it too, and were able to get pictures like this. They were able to make a, a further experiment and say, well, let's take two samples. Just a sort of, whoa, too far. Yeah. Let's take a lean mouse and let's take an obese mouse and look at the liver cells. And you see striking differences. In the lean mouse, uh, the ER is organized very nicely in sheets. In the obese mouse, it's very tubular. 
and uh, you know, this with FibSim is just very easy to uh, uh, you know pose these experiments, run them almost. Uh, Sean has gotten it almost to a push button kind of operation, and then the analysis, of course, always takes longer uh, to pull the data out. And here, li liquid droplets can be identified. Uh, you know, this is also on bioarchive uh, right now. So I think the next big challenge is, uh, can we take this a step further? Uh, and that takes me to correlative light and electron microscopy. With electron microscope images, it's always, you know, we're just looking at a heavy metal stain on membranes or certain proteins that like to suck up the heavy, the osmium. And it gives us a, a good global overview, gets all the organelles. Uh, some set of proteins can be ID'd by morphology, like the microtubules, uh, but it's non-specific. You know, there really are 10,000s of diff different proteins in a cell, and we're missing that information. Fluorescence microscopy is just at the polar op opposite of that. It's super specific to a target of protein. But typically, you can only see just a few, one, two, or three of what might be thousands. And if you look at it very closely, uh, specifically in super resolution, uh, you're often looking at you know, glowing blobs floating in darkness. And context is really uh, a big factor. So you know, again, this is a quick review. GFP is wonderful. You can label arbitrary proteins in cells. And uh, if you look at it carefully, it's uh, under a light microscope, it's diffraction limited. But you know, Eric and I, we learned that it's switchable. And the fact that it's switchable allows us for those switchable molecules to play this game where we can do photoactivated localization microscopy. So that's good. So it'd be nice if we could marry this electron microscopy with some form of super resolution light microscopy. And typically what, we, what happens, we end up in this uh, dichotomy between good and bad. We might have bad EM images, uh, but then we get good light microscope images. In other words, we fix weakly. It uh, doesn't preserve the ultrastructure, but the fluorophores and antigenicity or things like that are all well preserved. At the other extreme, we do strong fixation, kills the fluorescence or labeling properties of it. So one way out was to do cryofluorescence and cryofixation. So if you look at the process flow that happens when we uh, try to make the FIBSEM images, we culture them on uh, sapphire cover glasses, we high pressure freeze them, and then we do this freeze substitution, put them in plastic, stain them with osmium, chop them up into appropriate size FIBSEM, and we got our data. Now let's just look at the first part. So after high pressure freezing, there's an opportunity. We can take this frozen sample and put it under an objective while it's frozen. And so we do this by taking a sample and transferring it through a vacuum load lock close to the objective, image through this window while it's being cooled. And then at the other end, we can provide excitation, we can do structured illumination, and we can do uh, palm also, or single molecule localization. Now, one of the wonderful things that happens when you go to low temperatures is that the fluorophores become almost immortal. Um, you know, singlet oxygens don't get produced and they can't migrate uh, to the extent they can when it's a, a liquid. And so the, they, they just last forever, you know, hundreds of times longer. And so this is really of great benefit when you try to do structured illumination. At low temperatures, when you uh, illuminate, they, they just don't bleach as you go from the bottom of the cell to the top of the cell. So you can do this very easily in three dimensions and in multicolor. And it's, uh, it's pretty quick. This palm technique, um, it, it also works at low temperatures, uh, but it's much slower than the SIM technique. So the two techniques are very nice and complementary, and we use them together. Uh, one to sort of screen for cells of interest and the other to get more detail. So if we try to do this photoactivated localization, 
we have to sort of bleach out the molecules to a certain extent. And the longer we wait, the better we can see the blinking. Now you can see over here toward the red side, the quality of the samples or the, of the imaging is not as good. There's a lot of background. It's not that easy to, to separate the, you know, the molecules, particularly in areas where they're relatively dense. Whereas here for these colors, it is easy to separate. And uh, <clears throat> so we, uh, yeah, so we, when we do this, we find usually a nice combination of uh, colors is this uh, Janelia floor, uh, 525 and M emerald. So we can get two colors, you know, at, uh, at low temperatures. And here's sort of the, the final segmented picture that might be formed. And actually, yeah, just to sort of go back, uh, we find it, it's useful to go to a little bit lower temperature because under those conditions, we can actually get two colors. 77 tends to restrict us a little bit more to, to one color. So we get the, you know, the other floor for performing a, a little bit better. So what this means is we've just opened up a space. We added this uh, sim palm. And now we have data that we can correlate. And so we now have, you know, a second color available. Uh, resolution is not as good as the fifth sim, but in any case, it can sort of give a lot of information. Here's what the data looks like. There might be a, a fifth data set up here. <clears throat> and then there's a matrix and it crosses and cross with either sim or with palm to give an overlay data set. And this is all in 3D too. So registrations super important. If we look carefully, we might see a, a shape of a, a mitochondria in this case, or in the ER, and we can see the corresponding parts of the ER, uh, you know, down below. So there's a, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, there's a correction vector. So if we correct the mitochondria, we might have one correction vector. If we correct for the ER, there might be a different correction vector. And if they're close, but not quite the same, that's a little bit of an error. And that gives a sense of the accuracy of our registration. Typically, we have to do this with multiple points, maybe 100 or so throughout the sample, uh, like, <clears throat> like this. And the net errors you know, can sort of arrange, depending on how close you are to you know, good reference points, you know, maybe down to you know, 30 or 40 nanometers uh, you know, with the error. Most of the distortion happens a little bit around the nucleus. And the distortion happens because during the free substitution, water goes out, alcohols and uh, you know, resin dye monomers are coming in, and there's a little bit of change in shape. So here you can see the fluorescence in, um, in, in the colors, in overlay. And even these fine little varicosities that you see in the ER, in the fluorescence, they're actually real. They're not artifacts. They, they, they faithfully reflect themselves. So that was a little bit of validation. Now you find little spots of, let's say, this uh, ER fluorescent protein here, or a mitochondrial fluorescent protein there. They're not noise. Uh, if you look at the same parts in the EM image, you might see a tiny little vesicle, which happens to be either ER rich or TOM20 rich. So now we've really added information to something which from the EM level is you know, almost identical. Proxisomes is a similar example. You know, here we have, uh, we can light them up with the SKL label, find them in ER, and they can be confirmed. We can do this for multiple proxisomes. And in the end, you could say, let's find all the proxisomes in a cell. You can sort them by size, shape, or any other parameter that might be of interest. <clears throat> we can also, um, yeah, here's another example with uh, done with collaboration, Dave Selecci, um, where he just wanted to look at a membrane uh, between uh, two granule neurons. And there's a, a protein, JAMC, uh, which we, yeah, connected to a uh, yeah, genetic 549. And uh, yeah, Debrin, they're both involved. And if we look at this boundary between the two cells, you find there's a dark region, a light wiggly region, and a dark region. That can be 
just you know segmented out or annotated like this. If you look at the fluorescence, <clears throat> you see almost uh, you know it correlates very nicely. So now you can see the correlation between what you might see in uh, the FIPSEMP data set by itself matches <clears throat> the fluorescence, and you just see patches, large areas of <clears throat> uh, areas which are rich in one protein and not in the other. <clears throat> so finally, one more example. This is an old movie from Eric Betzik's uh, Lattice Light Sheet, <clears throat> where uh, a T cell is attacking some cancer cell. And you saw the little red dots, these are lytic granules that the, cancer, that the T cell uses to inject and break apart the cancer cell. And just to spark your imagination, this is a cover slip where we have lots of T cells and lots of cancer cells, and they all are walking around. <clears throat> Some are attacking each other at various stages. Now we switch to the FIBSEM images, segmented out. There's the T cell in front, cancer cell in the back, which is being attacked. And uh, <clears throat> here we cut through, and we can see the, the two nuclei. They have very different uh, grayscale characteristics. The dark spots over here that you'll see in a second again are the uh, <clears throat> lytic granules. And if you look closely, you can see sort of a cupping that takes place right here between the uh, T cell which uh, typically happens on an immunological synapse, which is pointed out here. And you know, I'm a little bit of loss on how to describe this other than this is basically a battle zone, you know, on sort of a primordial soup level, you know, where literally these granules are being injected. The HeLa sees what's going on. It throws up actin filaments. It tries to shed membranes to protect itself uh, as fast as it can. And, and you can do further labeling just to see, you know, on the fluorescent side, all what's happening here. But this is, and up here is even the centrosome, which is sort of the command and control center. Uh, that's my words for it. I'm not a biologist. <clears throat> so essentially, yeah, we've, uh, basically got to this region um, where we can now explore this region here. I didn't talk about this. We actually also have a, a multi-SEM approach. This should allow us to get even larger data sets by maybe about a factor of 30 or 50 more, <clears throat> which could have some other, other applications, but that's, that's, that's for the future. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, collaborators. Uh, David Hoffman uh, was uh, the postdoc who made the palm sim and responsible for some of the uh, <clears throat> cryo, uh, cryo imaging. Uh, Gleb also uh, was a, uh, you know, also equally associated with uh, a lot of the cryo uh, effort. Sean Zhu, mainly on the FIB sim, Ken Hayworth, a little bit all over the place uh, in various aspects. Um, <clears throat> Dave Peel sort of working on a few other things right now. And of course, a lot of collaborators along the way. Uh, in the FlyEM, Janile has project teams. So the FlyEM project team was sort of a key in taking the data from just grayscale to really biological meaningful things. And the COSEM is looking also to take some of the FIPSEM cell data and take a, a little bit of a, a cellular angle to all of this and making it available. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody and I'll let this you know pretty video play in the background. Thanks, Harald. Uh, ex excellent talk. Like, uh, I, I guess th there are a lot of questions already. Uh, but I think uh, Stephanie we will do the quiz first and then we take the questions, right? Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, that's fine with me. So the quiz is um I'm not sure anyone wants to uh, not just watch the movie, actually, because it's so amazing. <laughs> so I just a lot of biology, right? That you I know, fantastic. Like... <laughs>
<laughs> so the quiz is um, well. Thank you. Also, the speaker also had to kind of um, provide um, questions for his own talk and answers. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I need to kind of um, you need to stop screen sharing for me. So. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. So mm -hmm. the movie's ending now. You can put it back up when we are done okay. with the quiz. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a lot more exciting than the quiz, but I um <laughs> so the few people who I think the quiz questions are also great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Is that okay? Does this share proper? Can you just confirm yes. this sharing? Yes. Okay. Okay. Because I, I don't know what I shared. So, okay. So people, can you just sign in? So I, I always start with a joke question. So the question was at which temperature are you performing your imaging? I thought because we're talking about cryo imaging, but some people, um, I think just talk about their personal body temperature. <laughs> but it just gives you time to actually log into the question and into the Mentimeter. Anyone who's missed it, it's in the chat. So I put the link into the chat. So this is just, um, I like super hot, as obviously. <laughs> Some cool person. So, um, okay, anyone? Minus 158 is the coldest uh, temperature, I think, yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's start then the actual quiz. So anybody um, playing is going to have a, be presented with um, uh, one of those um, funny symbols. They don't need to put their name, but they could if they wanted. But yeah, so here we have now the first um, question. So what's the name of a software routine that can unwarp 3D EM data onto super resolution fluorescence data? And you have a um, time mm -hmm. is up now. <laughs> Excellent. And 15 people got the answer right, which is great. So you know, you also have to be quick. So it's not just the right answer, but also fast. Um, now you have, to... have wrong answers, you can still win. Yeah, sometimes we had some funny snags and the Mentimeter where it didn't really matter. Whatever you picked, it was fine. What is a reasonable sample volume to acquire with high resolution and one month of FIPS from imaging? I think that's quite a, I think three million a lovely million question. Million and so the time up. So people are saying 30 micron cube. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Some people are very ambitious. They think it's three millimeter. I think that's the future, but maybe that's kind of coming too. But <laughs> so question number three. Um, how long does it take to fit um, a fly brain? So I think that's, um, that was very much in the beginning of your talk. I think you answered this. Um, People say four years. I mean, it depends. Maybe if you have, depends how many you have systems, you have imaging systems you have. But so it was one year with eight trips. And so <laughs> again, I think a lot of people listened very carefully and also remember the, the numbers you kind of gave us. So they missed the two trips. Uncommissioned to flip <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So what is the advantage of going below 77K for cryo-imaging? And again, like, so I could read the answers, but maybe just, oh, nobody said it costs more money. I thought that was a... <laughs> So again, I think um, the majority did get, but I think a few were also interested, I think in the floor for blinking and the different floor floors and wondering about those in terms of the temperature. 
preserving. So the question number five. So this is your last chance. So if you, a lot of people have been correct with the answers so far. So I think this is going to be the decisive question maybe. So what is the most reasonably reasonable prior correlative protocol? And then there are four options. And the time is up. All right, okay. So the majority of people, I think there was always quite a strong majority. So let's see um, who's going to be the winner. So it was high pressure freeze, cryosome, cryopalm, gypsum, and we should have a leaderboard now. Yep. And there's someone who's um, only giving his initials WG. So whoever WG is, you've won this amazing prize for So you're going to be sent a full scope because we figured a lot of people were not able to access their microscope. So we're giving you a full scope so you can fold your microscope and have a bit of fun. And I think quite a few people enjoy sharing this with children as well. So, but I guess scientists are always a bit like grown up children. So I think everybody probably benefits from that. So thank you very much for participating, but um, whoever is probably preparing the, um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, um, preparing and looking, has looked at the um, chat questions, and I think we want to pick up obviously now the real questions from there. That's quite a long list, so even if we don't go through, I think we could maybe even just give them to Harold if he was kind to answer them, but Let's see if we can get through them. Yeah. So yeah, if, if WG wants to reveal himself, we can uh, give you uh, some applause. <laughs> else, like uh, just contact Stephanie. Yeah, that's always the, the awkward interaction. Uh, so. <laughs> what we also do is uh, 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 we are we unmute everyone, uh, and so all the people who have asked questions, you can ask yourself. So like Cherry Huang, Catherine Lau, uh, Ben Edaro, and then uh, Yema, and then Maud, and then Abigail and, and Michael. So, so in that order, uh, which you have asked the questions. So if you, if you want to ask your questions yourself, uh, please go ahead. And, uh, and yeah, uh, so I guess WG hasn't messaged anything. So, so, uh, so Harald, we will go with the first question. Cherry Huang, you want to ask okay. your question yourself or? No, so, uh, so her question is, uh, due to the small voxel size, the data size of a single 3D uh, FIPSEM image could be extremely huge. That means those high resolution images could be very difficult to handle and process. Could you give some information about the requirements, hardware and software and difficulties when doing image data processing and presentation? Okay, yes, and that's, that's a very, very relevant question. As, as they're beginning to type to it, but I'm not the fastest type here. There's too much information to convey. Um, we, uh, at, at one level, I mean, just having a, a workstation, which is at the high end loaded up with a terabyte of RAM and, you know, uh, and lots of parallel processors in there, you know, for being about 20, 30 K or so is, is a good start. Um, you know, I, I expect in the future, maybe some of this will take more on, you know, take place more on the cloud. Uh, we let most of the processing go over to the real processing experts and they tend to form their own uh, pipeline. So I'd really encourage people to connect into that. I mean, the big warp, which uh, uh, Stefan Salfeld developed, I think is very powerful and that can allow you to, you know, explore the images on, uh, on, on a simple workstation. Uh, but I think, you know, this is something which is in process. There are, again, you, uh, on, on the different uh, approaches, whether it's for the connectome, there are environments for that, Newprint, which allows you to look at the process data or raw data through NeuroGlancer, which is a nice package. Um, or also the COSAM is trying to provide a, a little bit there. But uh, yeah, data requirements are big. And we'll, this, is, this is an active area of research and uh, development right now. So, uh, Harald, a couple of related questions. Uh, so first is like, is Genelia planning to set up their own some cloud service that 
people can just access the software and you know um, and do some some analysis for their own research let's say all the gpus and the computing yeah i don't think uh, i mean we're trying to make the data available through the cloud uh, I saw that Aubrey is going to be talking uh, in, I think, another month or so in this series. And you can ask her that question directly since she's sort of managing the COSEM project. Um, these will be probably discussions that we'll be having ourselves. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of things to do. Um, and, you know, maybe other people can set up cloud services for the analysis too. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's a big challenge. Yeah, uh, roughly, how much does it cost, like, to set up a FIPS and, like, money-wise, let's say? Oh, uh, <laughs> actually, you buy a FIPSIM and you know there are various configurations that you can have on it, depending on how much you load it up. Uh, you know, with stuff, it's um, you know maybe a, a little bit over a million dollars, and then. You know, maybe you have to do a hundred or hundred thousand or a little bit over that. Uh, you know, for custom electronics, if you customize it and uh, take control of it the way we do, because what Sean set up is a basic fib sim. We mount it in a certain way with hardware, but then the whole software wrapper around it is controlled via Sean's own LabVIEW environment and data acquisition system and uh, uh, which is on top of it. So I think in one level you could say, gosh, somewhere million-ish dollars or maybe touch north of it, depending on the configuration is, uh, you know, maybe very reasonable compared to when you think, well, what's the price of a, a new confocal and just the value of the data that you can get out of these systems. You know, because here you're seeing not just a couple of fluorescent channels, but everything. Uh, but with the caveat, of course, mm -hmm. that they're dead cells. You know, some people don't like dead cells. Um, and of course, uh, you know, it's a, it's a bit slower too. So like you did with the lattice light sheet that, you know, uh, researchers from all over the world could come up, you helped with the design and and some instructions. Any plan to do similar for FIPSIM, FIPSIM or you're already doing it? Um, right now, there's, uh, I mean, there's there's a, a package that we put together. I guess Albert Cardona was, uh, was using it and one can approach HHMI, you know, you know, the IP, the intellectual property department. And, you know, we could share, you know, what we have on our, you know, our drawings and protocols and things like that. Um, I think it would be cool if this could sort of be developed a little bit on the, on the commercial side. I think there's probably a lot of, uh, I think, hidden demand as soon as people realize what it can do. Again, compared to maybe the information value you get out of, a, say, a confocal to what you can get out here. I think it's very complementary and it should be a of a lot of value to biologists. Uh, okay. I hope something will be developing in that, that direction. FIBSEMs exist right now uh, commercially, but typically they can run for about seven days at the top, tall end or maybe four or five days typically before you need to go through a process called reheat. And in a reheat, you know, the beam pointing might be different. The room environment also can change over a several day period, which can cause some bad milling. So you do have to implement feedback techniques and a lot of other very careful control. And it's not just the instrument, it's uh, the whole way of operating it, you know, sort of the maintenance and, uh, you know, the environment around it uh, to make sure it's always operating at the top uh, level. But anyway, trying to run it stably for let's say three weeks is not nearly as ambitious as trying to run it for the equivalent of eight years uh, without an error or with maybe the fewest possible errors. Uh, so next question is from uh, Catherine. Uh, you want to ask? Uh, yeah, sure. Hara, very nice to meet you and thank you so much for the talk. It was um, really you. nice. And um, so my question is on the cryo palm. I was wondering if, um, 
it was a problem to have a refractive index um, change from air. I was seeing we used a dry objective for cryo and um, vitrified samples being 1.3 something in the refractive index. Did you um, have to correct the refractive index mismatch and how did you do that? Yeah, so the geometry, I didn't explain it very carefully, was a thin sapphire covered glass about 50 microns thick. On one side, the cells are sitting vitreously frozen. We don't image from the cell side. Light comes in from the other side. So we have a nice, planar, optically smooth glass surface, hopefully with no ice on it. And then that's inside vacuum behind a, uh, a window. Uh, I think it's a 0.7 millimeter window and then another air gap so basically a two millimeter working distance objective. The numerical aperture of that is low. The, the one we're using is a, a Nikon one and it has 0 0.85 uh, numerical aperture. Uh, it's, it was meant, I think, for looking through uh, uh, liquid crystal, you know, basically display windows. L LCD windows uh, for inspection purposes. Uh, but it has a correction collar and works nicely. So we lose a lot by having that low numerical aperture objective, uh, but we gain with simplicity because the rest we can just do on a regular optical bench for the whole microscope. And we're blessed by the fact that these floor fours last hundreds of times longer. So even though we have a lower numerical aperture, we, get, we can image these for a much longer time period, get better statistics and localization, which almost compensates pretty much for the lack of uh, numerical aperture on the resolution side. Can I just ask a follow-up question? Sure. Um, so compared with um, doing crab palm at room temperature, how does the localization accuracy compare when you do it cryo? Um, I think in XY, we're probably not too much worse. So like if you compare room temperature oil immersion objective and this cryopalm version with the low NA, um, the fact that we have a lot more photons almost compensates for the two. So I think they're, they're comparable, you know, maybe a little bit plus and minus. Now the big downside is the Z resolution. Uh, you know, we have the low numerical aperture uh, and our Z resolution is, you know, maybe what, 100, 140 or, 100, you know, say roughly 150 nanometers plus or minus a bunch, depending on the sample and conditions. So it's, uh, it's not as good in, in that direction. Um, but still, you know, it can give a lot of information and begin to say, okay, this protein is associated with this nor you know, nearby organelle, and it gives the, you know, the window of localization uh, can be reduced. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. So another next question is from Eduardo, and he has a couple of questions. The first one is, uh, how do you control the heating effect of FIPSIM on epoxy resin? And then he follows up with how are you controlling the charging? Okay. Um, yeah, we really don't see any heating effect when we run our FibSim over the top. Uh, you know, but there is certainly when we uh, go over the sample, there is certainly some surface damage. You know, it's just like any irradiation. It goes in there, it breaks some some bonds, and on a very local level, you know, maybe a few nanometers in, and maybe you could argue that is a heating effect. It was sort of a, I would think of it more of as a radiation effect, and that leads to probably some loss of oxygen, some cross-linking, and the nice thing what it does, it sort of carbonizes the very top surface layer uh, nicely for us, so much so that you get a conducting layer on the top. And so when we go back down and we try to image with the electron beam, we really don't see that much charging 
as you might see when you do a diamond knife cut, because there is now you know an extra dose of irradiation just coming from that beam strafing, the high energy beams, some chemical bonds changing, cross-linking happening. It's a little burnt, and it's burnt enough to make it conducting on the very surface. And we're, it's a little bit of a, you know, a nice side benefit associated with the uh, by the fib milling over what you might have with a, a diamond knife cut of a surface. Yeah, so the next question is from Yema. Uh, I can see that you are here. You want to ask your question yourself? Oh, yes. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, Dr. Haas. Uh, I just want to ask a simple question. So uh, we know that in 3D same image, we always see some fine structure for the DNA staining. And I wonder if using the correlative imaging uh, that is related to the same to electron microscopy, we can identify uh, that kind of fine structure is real structure or it's just the reconstruction artifact. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think there, yeah, it depends on which fine structure uh, and you're talking within the nucleus. Yes. Uh, yeah, we see, uh, and there are a few things in there. I mean, there are things which seem to be very granular. Uh, you could attribute them maybe to lysosomes or maybe there might be other just large protein complexes. It's not quite clear uh, what they are. Typically, you think one would identify these and say, oh, they're the compacted heterochromatin areas. And then the spaces in between might be open for transcription in other areas. Uh, this is all, I think, pretty open and developing as one tries to begin to map an interpretation on that. This is very ready for a lot of correlative experiments, actually. Uh, we did a, a few of them, and they were published in our science paper, uh, which came out you know, a little bit over a year ago, where we looked at the nucleus. And David Selecci, he was the one with the biological interest on it, um, you know, put a few different labels on there associated with the different histone types. And we could sort of associate them, you know, are they associated with uh, you know, an active transcription or not? Uh, but I think with better localization and more probes to that nature, one can begin to you know, identify and maybe give a little bit deeper meaning to just these black spots or not so dark stained areas within the nucleus. And I think this, we're, we're standing at the edge of a, I think a big opportunity right now. So Harald on, on the same line, like uh, when you showed the, the, T the T cells and the, and the cancer cells, the heterochromatin uh, staining was much stronger in the T cells. It was, let's say much more prominent and cancer cells, it was a bit loose and uh, it was much more continuous. And in the helper cell, it was like, you could see like, uh, at the nuclear membrane prominent gaps. So, so what do you think about some relative inferences that we can draw? You know, you have two cells right there, even if there are some, let's say, artifacts, you can still do some relative comparisons and draw some, some biologically relevant, you know, uh, inference. Yeah, I, I think this is all, again, super interesting. Uh, yeah, I've been, yeah, looking at the two nuclei, one's <laughs> darker than the others. It might be a pH effect. Uh, and, and you notice one nucleus is a lot smaller. Yeah. You know, it's much more compacted in one cell type than the other. Another thing, I didn't point it out, but if you look at the mitochondria, the mitochondria close to the area where the cell is being attacked are very dark, very black. And the ones at the backside are light and normal looking. So we think there might be some some other factors coming in, which are describing maybe it's the pH level of the cell, you know, because the cell's probably punctured at the front end, and maybe the damage or diffusion of the whatever appropriate ions hasn't communicated all the way to the back. Uh, I think, you know, again, it's research. One should really look and try to understand what might be artifacts and 
you know, maybe they actually might have some real meaning behind them and one could sort of get a little bit more confidence that uh, this is not just a questionable artifact, but we can sort of assign some biological relevance to this all. Yeah, I heard some, some one famous scientist say, you know, most of the imaging is artifacts, some of them are useful. Uh -huh. and, and, and most of science is almost relative, right? So I think you have almost uh, all, all ingredients to make some biological conclusions. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Maud. Uh, it's on a uh, cryo palm. Did you notice signs of lo local defitrification? Def 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 oh, did I what? Use uh, defitrification? Yeah. Did I use devitrification? Yeah. Did you notice any signs of local devitrification? Oh, no. I think there might have been sometimes early when we were very concerned about it, uh, depending on what kind of cryoprotectant we put around and some of our approaches to the, uh, you know, to the freezing where we might have been suspicious about it. Uh, but I think, you know, we're comfortable with the high pressure freezing process right now. We certainly keep it cold all the way. We're very protective of that. So the sample stays cold in the whole transfer from the high pressure freezer into the cryo uh, fluorescence and then back out into the free substitution. So we never let it go up in temperature. And the imaging also, because the cell is on a sapphire cover glass, sapphire is highly conducting at low temperatures. And that also helps ensure that we have a, uh, you know, any heat that might form from the imaging is quickly conducted away and that we uh, you know, keep the low temperatures on it and avoid defertification. So Harold, uh, we are almost time, but if you have energy to take a few more questions, we can go. Uh, there are still like four or five interesting questions, but what do you say? That's fine, That's fine. I'm cool, good, go ahead. So Abigail, you are next and I can see you already here. So you want to ask your question yourself? Hi, sure. Hi. Uh, Great talk, thank you, Harold. This is really interesting. Um, we also are in the cryo world, and so I have to say I'm really curious about this setup that you um, have talked about regarding the cryofluorescence. And um, I think you've sort of already answered my initial question, which was, what is this setup? We use a cryo lincum stage, but it sounds like you have a very custom built system. Um, so I guess that sort of answered that. I would sort of adjust my question to then ask, to, have you considered doing your milling in the fib not on resin, but on cryo samples so that you don't deal with any of that movement of your, you just have better registration? Is there thought in that direction? Yeah, yeah, that, that brings up a whole different area of then, if you mill it under that, then you have to afterwards image it and then you ask what kind of imaging uh, so cryo milling can be done but then if you go through an osmium staining step then you probably still have some distortions which uh, which do take place um, we find the distortions actually to be manageable you know one just sort of has an extra label hanging around which labels a number of points throughout the cell and we can sort of uh, register back onto it. So if you take the option of, let's say, trying to go without any osmium staining, then you have to ask, okay, what's the contrast of, you know, that remains? I know there've been some papers showing that, yes, indeed, uh, if you image quite a bit more slowly, you can actually pull up contrast. Uh, on a, uh, a fib uh, vitrified cell. And, uh, but I think, you know, the imaging speed is, is quite a bit slower and you do have to deal with probably, um, you know, charging artifacts and things like that way more carefully. So we haven't taken that approach, you know, at the moment. And there's a, yet another option, which is to say, okay, do the milling uh, at cryogenic temperatures. And then the imaging is not going to be SEM imaging, but maybe transmission 
<clears throat> you know, in sort of the tradition of, uh, you know, tomography and just look at the, the vitrified sample itself. And yeah, that can be done too. Um, but I, we're, we're thinking about that, uh, but for that, I think the, the normal uh, Z resolution that we have right now with the cryo palm is maybe a little substandard and we're looking right now trying to develop a cryo interferometric palm which should give us much better Z resolution. And then that could be sort of a good basis for really defining you know, lamella, which could go into a TEM. But that's research and little development that's a little bit further out there. So Abigail mentioned Lincoln. So our next question is from Michael from Lincoln. So Michael, you want to ask, <laughs> let's tell about your cryo stage maybe. <laughs> I have a, uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. I have a question uh, on one of your earlier slides. Maybe it's a bit of a beginner's question. Um, you mentioned that you have the waviness problem. So you need to mill and then every 50 microns or so you need to uh, physically cut to, to basically uh, restore the straightness. Mm. Uh, my question is, um, you have this very fancy uh, iron beam machine. Is there really no way to uh, measure the, the surface flatness and uh, correct for this flatness problem in the process? Or is, is, there, is there an answer or a simple answer why that, why that uh, can't be done or why, that, why this is difficult? Yeah, we've, there, there might be some approaches on it, but if you just have a very simple system, what happens when you image, mm -hmm. you do form a crust okay. of extra carbonized stuff and below the composition is different. And when you go in with the fib, strafing across the surface, you know, there's a, a slight instability where it might dig in a little bit, it changes the slope a tiny amount, and then it can hit that surface a bit more straight on. There's enhanced milling in that area. And then that area can grow and gets pushed down. And, and away. Uh, and I like, again, use the analogy of, uh, you know, waves on a pond. Now, if you image very with very light dose, uh, this isn't as pronounced and you can mill much more deeply. So, you know, one's working within a little bit of a constrained world of trying to get fine resolution, you burn the surface, you're a little more prone to the waviness. There, there's a technique to reduce that instability by putting the ups, have an upstream part of Durkerpan resin. It's just coated maybe five, 10 microns thick. So you start out, you know, with a, a very, uh, a plastic which has a very good milling, uniform milling properties. And that gets the whole milling process to start on the image side very smoothly and then that uh, it keeps a better stability for that and Durkapan in general is a resin which sort of mills more uniformly than than other resins for some reason mm. and uh, there, there is apparently no way to locally remove material to straighten it uh, there, there is no easy i don't think that would be too e easy right now to you know try to say okay here it's thicker than here uh, because we're working in a, a very tangential yeah. mode. We're not trying to sort of mill at a finite angle where we could target areas. You, you, we're you, really strafing it and getting the whole air surface at once. You might need a completely different tool to do that, but you would then avoid the, uh, the task of physically cutting. Yes, yes. I, yeah, it would, it would be some different approach. Best would be trying to understand in a little bit more detail, what causes the milling instabilities and try to stabilize against it. Yeah. But there are big differences depending on what kind of resin you have. Yeah. Okay. Epon easily forms these waves, Durkapan not so much. Yeah. And if you look up one, one form burns easier than the, and the others more 
for example, fire retardant. You know, it has more circular, you know, benzene ring-like structures throughout it, and yeah. might be naturally a little bit more stable. Okay, thank you for your uh, explanation. Thank you. Okay, thanks. There are one last question, which is also okay. a good concluding question, uh, and it's from Jan Eves. Um, so he asked, "How do you see the future?" to better increase the throughput of FIPSIM and uh, the use of correlative techniques. So. Okay. Um, throughput, I think we're probably close to the physics limits on that, you know, because literally it's just dependent on the, uh, the electron beam. You have only so many electrons. And with that, you can say, okay, what's the most that you can get uh, signal out uh, from the instrumentation side. Uh, the other end is sample staining. You know, that's if one can increase contrast in any way, you know, that's a huge factor. And I think there's a ton of room to play in there. And uh, it, it can have huge impacts on, you know, on your ability to image quickly, you know, across, uh, you know, across multiple different samples or maybe even enhance areas that you're that are of interest. Yeah, and there's a whole other area of having maybe electron specific stains in there. And the other question was on use of correlative techniques. Future of correlative. Um, I think I mean all these are pretty wide open areas. Um, I think there's the cryo correlative, there's more to explore there. Uh, but cryo is unfortunately, you know, it can be a little bit annoying for some. It's not as easy as just sort of tossing a sample in very quickly. Uh, if fluorophores can be made uh, in plastic that survives the whole plastic embedding and uh, devitrification and other processes like that, that could be a huge game changer in terms of the uh, you know the flow that biologists would like to uh, like to use getting more colors to work you know at the cryogenic level or you know at some room temperature level would be would be cool getting this uh, you know molecules which are in room temperature plastic to to blink in a nice optimal controlled way so you can really do the quality of super resolution localization at room temperature in osmium stained plastic would be transformative too. I'm not sure if that's possible. It's, you know, beyond my little expertise, but that, that could also be very, very transformative. But I sort of see, well, maybe in the meantime, you know, I think the cryogenic approach certainly has a lot of merits to it. You know, it's a little more complicated, uh, but, you know, I think, I think very, you know, very doable. And I think at the edge of being, you know, transferred maybe into a more wide scale, wide scale approach. Uh, ours right now, it, it's, a, you know, it is a, a customized vacuum chamber approach. You know, that gives a lot of advantages, you know, from our point of view. And, um, you know, maybe at some point that can also with time sort of go a little bit more mainstream too. Certainly, I always find that the electron microscopists are very comfortable with, uh, you know, more complicated technologies uh, than people used to doing optical microscopy. They're spoiled, you know, you just press a button and in a few minutes you got a live cell doing wonderful things. Uh, so I think it'll be a little bit of a, a mixing of the two cultures and patients levels to really see what, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, to, to get at all of these capabilities for everybody. And, and the future, in a way you say, like belong to the chemists now. Uh, I think a lot to the chemists, exactly. I, I think they, they can have a big transformative step on it. And to the biologists to help define where, yeah. where to go with these problems too, because I, I, the other fear that I have is, okay, one generates data, which is cool, but, you know, it sits there. Okay, the next step, okay, you segment it. But maybe that sits there too. Uh, people have to think, okay, how, it has to then have biologically driven questions sort of behind it. You know, so 
you know, one person mm -hmm. said is, uh, you know, the, you know, knowledge, you know, is basically knowing the difference that makes a difference. So we can't just sort of have just one cell. At some point, we need to have multiple cells, mutant varieties, see what the difference is, get some biological meaning deductions out of that. And it'll, we're going to be going in that direction. For also, Hanal, yeah. There is a saying, you, you see the a lion in a jungle once. So you might not have many replicates. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you, so uh, also, this is a very awkward uh, end to most of our talks as we cannot invite you for a morning coffee or a, or a lunch or a brunch. And uh, mm -hmm. we have several thoughts. We are, oh, you have some. <laughs> I got my orange juice here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So, uh, Stephanie, you want to say something, but yeah, this is an awkward end. We are planning some, some, some things for our speakers, and hopefully we will materialize it very soon so that there is some, some souvenir or some memento to, for the speakers, but yeah. Right now. Yeah, so yeah. at the moment we just have to thank you. Yeah. And um, but I mean we had I think you were actually the star speaker in terms of also the numbers. Um, yeah. because I think this was the largest audience we have been able to gather, even more than Ed Boyden. I don't know if that's a kind of Oh yeah, you, you, you outperformed Ed Boyden by a fair amount. <laughs> no, it's not a competition, but thank you yeah. very much. Um the yeah. audience it was I mean it was really amazing. It was, um, everybody was so grateful and it was not really, I think these sessions are really lovely. So people have actually very practical questions and they feel like they can just have a, it's like a workshop um, more than just a presentation. Mm -hmm. And we really appreciate your time now. And we are a bit over time. So we need to kind of clap in this awkward way and say, thank you very much. And, and um, much. Yeah. send you on the way wherever you are. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. We hope to see you in person in a much Some... nicer setting really than this is. But then this gives us really the opportunity to have people like you in a relatively easy way while, while you probably can have breakfast now. So thank you. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thanks thank very you much. So Thanks much. everybody for joining. Bye everyone. Bye bye.